Welcome to the Family Life Blended Podcast. I'm Ron Deal. We help blended families and those who love them pursue the relationships that matter most. And on this edition of Family Life Blended, we're exploring how to pursue the reconciliation of strained parent-child relationships within blended families. Did you know that mostly due to stress, children leave step family homes at younger ages than children in biological parent homes? Have you lost connection, perhaps, with any of your children? If so, I know your heart is hurting. I know you're feeling the stress as, as Christmas approaches. Stay with me. When I wrote my first book, The Smart Step Family, I can't believe it's been over 20 years now, Christian step family resources were really hard to find. But now, the blended family ministry movement is gaining speed, and many resources exist, and Family Life Blended is the leading organization in that movement. But without you, we can't get those resources to the people who need them most. We've just started our December year-end matching gift opportunity. Folks, we have a $40,000 gift that we need to match by December 31st, 2023. Every dollar you give is going to be doubled, but if we don't match it, There's a risk of losing those dollars. Over the next few years, we have plans to expand throughout North America, throughout the world. We're working with partners around the world. That's just one strategic goal for Family Life Blended, but we can't do that or anything else without the cumulative generosity of people like you. So maybe you just want to say thank you for this podcast and the way that it served you or One of our books, resources, video series, live events, live stream events. You just want to say thank you. That's great. This is the time to do it. Month of December. Or maybe you just want to help us reach other people because you know how big the world is. There's lots of people out there who need a little guidance. As you pray through your year-end giving, would you consider making a designated gift to Family Life, specifically to Family Life Blended, our division? That's really going to empower us and it's going to help us meet that match. Family Life has many ministries, so we've got to make sure the money is designated to Family Life Blended. Show notes are going to get you connected and linked to the right place. You know, one of the stories we hear in our ministry is from parents who have lost connection with a child, often an adult child, as a matter of fact. Whatever the reason, there's been a falling out. Parents feel a lot of pain and loss, and they struggle to know what to do and how to reconnect. I mean, really, what do you do? Well, that's the topic of this edition of Family Life Blended. Even if you don't have a strained relationship today, let me just invite you to stay with us. I think the principles you learn just might help you avoid some mistakes with children of any age in the future. Dr. Charlotte Melcher Smith has been a clinical director and a therapist for over 30 years. Among other things, she's actively counseled both alienated parents and their estranged adult children. She and her first husband also worked on the staff of Crew for 19 years, working with college students. Dr. Smith was widowed after 49 years of marriage and eventually married again, forming a blended family with five adult children. Her book, Life's Third Try, as in trimester, offers a unique Christian perspective about the empty nest. Charlotte, thanks for joining me today. I'm honored to have the opportunity. Okay, let's start with what sometimes goes wrong. What are some of the factors that contribute? You know, I I was thinking about this earlier today. I think about uh, my children are all young adults at this point. And when they were younger, you know, there were seasons of just utter bliss when our kids were young. We love sure. them. They love us. You know, it's hard to imagine a time when you can sort of not like your kid or you worry so much or they don't want to have a relationship with you for whatever reason. Can we just talk around that for a minute? What are some of the things that you've seen over the years are factors that lead to difficult parent-child relationships? Well, if there's been trouble in the home before they become adults, the chance that there will be trouble after they leave home is even greater. Mm. However, uh, there are so many families that were very close Mm. and uh, enjoyed all the wonderful adventures that families have together. Uh, And then at some period, sometimes as soon as college age, 
there seems to be a repudiation of all that came in that home. Uh, right now, a lot of repudiation of the values that they associate with the home, the Christian morality that um, was expressed in that home, um, the worldviews. And uh, at this point, uh, many young people are surrounded by those who do not have any kind of a Christian perspective, may never mm -hmm. even have been exposed to the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so they are going through their own period of trying to figure out what they think and what they believe. Uh, and uh, it, it's very uncomfortable for them because they know what mom and dad would like and they aren't sure they can be that person hmm. with the new questions they have. You know, I had a conversation with a dear friend recently who has worked in a, within a Christian organization her entire professional career. She and her husband both did. And um, we were talking about uh, our adult kids and she said, you know, we don't know hardly anybody our age who has now adult children who doesn't have at least one of their kids who has been in a situation like you were just describing, where they are stepping away from active uh, faith or active community within the, the Christian community. And it's just uh, agonizing to them. Yes. All the Barnapoles uh, are showing that, that we are losing... Uh, these kids to a different set of values, a different worldview than they were raised with. And we, we talk about the pain that parents feel, but it begins with shock. Mm -hmm. it, it's hard to believe that this person who you loved and nurtured and put your whole life into now sees you. Uh, one of my friends this week said, well, he called me a bigot and a dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe that, maybe that is a little bit of what we look like to wow. these young people. Wow. And that is so, so <laughs> difficult to deal with. You know, I was thinking of some other reasons. I, I sort of alluded earlier. I'd love your thoughts on this. I, I, I mentioned earlier in the episode that kids in blended families just leave home at a younger age. There seems to be this cumulative um, level of stress and you know, again, not every child, so I don't want people to panic, but on the whole, it happens at younger ages for children in blended families than it does for children growing up in a biological first family situation. They just feel like they're ready to move away from the stress. One of the things that connects to that is stress between homes, maybe stress mm -hmm. in a step parent, step child relationship. And you know, leaving home at 18 or getting going away and not coming back or finding other ways of uh, moving out of the home is a way to avoid that stress. Now, that doesn't help resolve anything. We all know that. But but it just tends to be a motivation to get kids out of the home. Have you There's seen so that? much anxiety in young people these days? And so anything that they feel might reduce that, um, they'll try it. And mm -hmm. they're in that stage when they are wanting to be independent uh, and they want it a little sooner if they aren't feeling very safe in their blended family. Mm -hmm. Something that's a little bit different than that is when the children were adults, maybe when the couple came together. We've seen this uh, quite a bit where a child who was connected with their formerly single parent. Now, you know, it's just um, it, there's a whole lot of more emotional work to be done when you're coming back home. But you have a step parent, you have maybe adult step siblings now and like what's that all about and now i have uh you know my my parent has step grandchildren and that seems to occupy their time and energy and so you know there's just a, again a number of reasons why they're not as motivated to hang around the house or to be with those people in person as much as they were and that can create that that hurt in a parent's mm -hmm. heart who just feels like they've lost connection well many kid. parents feel like my kid not only doesn't love me, he doesn't or she doesn't even like me. Uh, and that's an awful feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And then there's that situation where kids have a more passive home that they can go to and they can do whatever they want. And so moving out is more about going to the easy house, as I like to call it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And for that's sure. I mean, that's just part of the game, isn't it, for kids? I mean, they have those options. 
I hate to call it a game because it's not a game for us. It, 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 it hurts a parent's heart to be trying to teach and instill integrity in their, in their child. Um, but the child has those options, and therefore they have some power and leverage that they wouldn't have had otherwise, and sometimes they use it. Mm -hmm. Yes, for sure. Yeah, so uh, the other thing that I saw you write a little bit about is when a parent, um, they're the ones who close the door on the child, where they say, I'm done. I don't want anything more to do with this child. I don't, it just, you know, I don't even want to reach out to them. What would lead a parent to say something like that? Well, it's much rarer if you're talking about estrangement, total estrangement, or even off and on estrangement. 90% um, of the time, it's the children initiate that. Mm -hmm. But sometimes the parents do, and it often comes from a place of, I have to protect my heart. Um, what my child is saying is so disrespectful uh, and cruel, uh, and people want to throw around the word abusive way too much. Mm -hmm. um, but in today's society, that word is uh, jumped on by both generations sometimes to claim that that my parent is abusive because uh, they're saying no to a bunch of things I would like to have uh, or, or vice versa. Um, so kids are just confused as mm -hmm. to is this a safe place? And the parents are confused. Is Can I live my life with this amount of criticism and conflict? Uh, they, uh, many of them describe it to me as, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. This is the hardest thing I've ever had to deal with. Mm -hmm. You know, changing diapers and all that was a piece of cake. Uh, it's these grown-up years that have had me on my face. Right, right. And especially with the child is saying things or that are critical and negative mm -hmm. or re acting in rebellious ways. And it's so painful to watch with your, your son or daughter in terms of the choices that they're making. I can see how that would lead to somebody to go into self-protection mode mm -hmm. and uh, want to pull back. But uh, let's come back to that. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me just press in with what you just said for a minute. So I'm not talking about extreme circumstances of abuse where an adult child is physically hurting a, a parent. Right. Let's, yeah, that we're not talking about that right now. But when a parent has criticism coming their way and they are feeling the weight of that, how do they discern when that's a legitimate thing to say, oh, like I need some physical space between us or when they should not be looking to, to make that decision? Um. Well, as a whole, we tend to be very self-centered humans mm -hmm. on the whole. Yes. And when it becomes about uh, what's good for me, a parent may decide mm -hmm. that it's good for me to not have this person around anymore. And it might feel better. It, it might relieve a lot of tension. Mm -hmm. um, however, um, long-term, um, we are throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Mm. We are losing the chance to develop a friendship with these children if we can get through this stage where they are acting out. I so appreciate you saying that. Um, but let's press in because this is where the rubber meets the road. And it's it's hard to see. Let's just take an instance where your child is acting in some ways that are... <laughs> you know, it's harmful for them, spiritually speaking, okay? They're, they're doing things that you just know brings angst to your heart on their behalf. And, well, I just don't want to see it anymore. Then I won't feel the pain. So I'm just not going to call mm -hmm. them or spend time with them or, you know. But then you remove yourself from the equation. And no that, influence then. <laughs> Exactly. You lose your influence. The only way you gain influence, we've said this so many times on this podcast, here's a principle I want our listeners to catch. If you want to gain influence, you don't gain it by stepping back, by removing yourself. This is true in politics. <laughs> this is true in parenting. This is true in management of life and relationships. You move toward people to gain 
influence. Now, that means you are going to have to, what? How, how are you going to handle the pain that you're feeling from your child or seeing in your child that's bringing hurt to your heart? How are you going to manage that in order to keep your influence? Uh, I do think that sometimes there have to be some limits set around uh, how your children are allowed to talk to you. Um, but mostly we deal with this pain like any other pain that enters our life, whether it's physical, you know, we break a leg uh, or relational. We go to the Lord and we try to get a new perspective uh, and we look for what would God say uh, about this situation? And is this even about me? Or is this about something that's going on in my child's life? Mm -hmm. Can I remove myself from this situation emotionally to the degree that I, uh, of course, in Al-Anon, they call it detaching, but you detach uh, from being the brunt of anger that they may be experiencing and realize they are just angry because they are not happy. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, g give us a little more. How would you set boundaries? Like what would that sound like for a parent to potentially talk to a child about how the child is talking to the parent? Well, I think we want to uh, state it in a, a sense of I, not you must do something, but a boundary is something for me. So I would state it in terms of, uh, I can't be around you when you talk to me like that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go in my bedroom or I'm <laughs> going to go to my study and let's have this conversation later uh, when, when you can speak respectfully. Mm. Be in charge of yourself yes. and communicate that and then take action. Uh, for yourself and follow, and follow through yes yeah so you can't try to get them to change their behavior if you had that much power you would might not be having a problem <laughs> yeah. so obviously that's not uh, a, a strategy you can implement but yeah and and if we're talking about adults uh, we we can't discipline in the ways that we would have at a younger age and withdraw privileges and so forth yeah. so we have to be able to take care of ourselves and explain to them why we need to do that. Okay. So I think I'm hearing a balance between in this, in a situation where you're receiving some behavior or criticism or something that's really hurtful, you can take charge of yourself mm -hmm. and remove yourself from that situation, but you're not taking a complete cutoff posture with the child. Right. You've, you've got to overall, still be staying in relationship with them as best you can in order to have any influence, any opportunity right. to yeah. speak into their, their life, not control their life. Right. Control might've been what got you in trouble in the first place. In their um, minds. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. And say a little more about that, that in their mind, it, 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 sometimes it comes down to how the child feels like they've been parented. Yes. And Many of us uh, come from a background where rules were important to us and we wanted to be obedient to God's rules uh, and we probably emphasized them. Hmm. And you know, I had to go to my adult children and, and say, I've been more like a Pharisee than I recognized or than I want to be. Um, and the rules aren't the thing for me mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And how did that moment go? How'd they respond? Uh, I'm still waiting for some of that response, but uh, I think it was welcomed. Uh, and they're watching. Does she mean it? Yes. Uh, does Is she going to bring up some rule breaking that maybe would have um, been the way I would have defined it when they were younger? Mm -hmm. And instead, mm -hmm. are they getting validated for the good things that they are doing? You know, it's very hard for a parent when uh, you're getting blasted with criticism or even contempt uh, to stay exactly where you need to be. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a good word. 
and let me just say, I was about to ask, and what do we do when we're kind of just feeling ashamed of our own parenting? And we know we've made mistakes and we have regrets. What do we do with that? And I think you just demonstrated exactly what we do. And that is we apologize. Yes. We, we own it. And we, then we, we have to wait. It. Yeah. We have to wait uh, and we have to live it. Mm. You know, those kids, need, yeah, those kid need, kids need validation whenever you can give it. Uh, you know, I know a few parents that have wonderful families, and I'm always uh, surprised when I see the, the level to which they go to validate their children. Um, hmm. You know, they're always looking for what they can praise or notice that's positive. Uh, and that that's good when you have little kids and it's good when you got big ones. Mm. I don't think any of us ever get tired of encouragement. No. <laughs> we do get tired of criticism. <laughs> yes. That's why it's, it's the first of Gottman's horses that are uh, rushing through the home and stomping everything in this path. Yeah. If I could uh, just break that down a little bit for our listeners, uh, John Gottman's a researcher who has looked into a lot of what predicts divorce among married couples and uh, criticism and contempt. Uh, I often say contempt is criticism on steroids. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's just intentionally hurtful and really negative and name calling. And, and that, that when that is present, that's one of four things that really predicts a demise of the relationship. It's headed in the wrong direction. Now I'm always humbled because he also said all couples do all four of those things. Right. And yeah. that's true. I can be as critical as the next person. It's how much I do it, how often and uh, do, am I willing to change or work towards changing that and repent when I, when I have been contemptuous towards my wife or same thing, I think it would apply towards children. Yeah. I think there's even a ratio um, not sure what Gottman's is. I've heard several different people speak on this. Uh, I think it's around one out of seven mm. um, could possibly be a change your behavior kind of a comment. But the next six need to be positive mm -hmm. because otherwise you are viewed as that kind of a person. Yeah. Um, you know, she, my mom's read just some, critical. Kind I read of. some research recently, Charlotte, that shows that the brain all of our brains is far more attuned to negative than it is to positive. And it holds on to negative far more than it holds on to positives. Mm -hmm. And that just speaks to that uh, point that you just made. We, we, <laughs> if overall we're experienced as being negative and critical, that really goes a long way towards creating a lack of safety in that relationship. And our children will run from mm -hmm. us. They will run from our influence and they will not want our values. Yes. Well, you've already given us a couple of principles straight out of God's word. <laughs> Apologize, you know, mm -hmm. uh, own who we are and be humble about that and and uh, try to, to repent and repair the relationship. But you have some other uh, tips out of God's word for parents who have a strained relationship with their, uh, especially adult children. Let's just walk through some of those okay. for a few minutes. Uh, Ezekiel 18. Talk okay. to us. Okay. Ezekiel 18 is a, a passage that everyone that has an adult child uh, should be familiar with because it can uh, really give you some freedom. Hmm. Um, Gonna, kind of speaks to the guilt and shame that parents sometimes carry. Yes, I mean, it's it's a story where in the Old Testament, during the time of um, the divided kingdom, there was a proverb that was being bandied about. And it was uh, that the... Uh, Parents have eaten sour grapes, but their children's mouths pucker at the taste. Hmm. In other words, people were looking at everything that was going wrong in the younger generation as obviously the fault of the fathers or the mothers. Um, and God forbade the people to continue to use that proverb that they'd created 
And his response in, uh, in early in the, in the 18th chapter was, for all people are mine to judge, both parents and children alike. And this is my rule. The person who sins is the one who will die. Um, and he describes families where you have a good uh, father who does everything possible to be uh, a person of integrity. And he has a child who chooses the opposite. And he says, uh, that child is the one who is responsible for their choice, not the parent. But that uh, disrespectful son may also have children. And he, his son, let's say, uh, turns to God and lives an exemplary life. Uh, and this happens. You, you see in homes where there wasn't much background and wasn't much teaching where a child will choose to uh, be different than his parents in a good way. Mm -hmm. And he says, uh, what you ask, doesn't the child pay for the parents sin? Because they, they couldn't understand this. And they were making judgments, probably not only about their own children when they rebelled, but about other people's children. And I think mm -hmm. this is a burden that we carry when our children don't toe the line exactly like we had expected and prayed that they would. Um, I know I was a counselor at the time that I first realized that uh, maybe my children weren't going to turn out exactly in a cookie cutter fashion. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought maybe I need to take my sign down. I probably don't have any right to mm -hmm. counsel anybody if my own children, let's say, are struggling with their faith. Um, and so it's important, I think, for people to deal with this idea that good parents automatically produce children that will follow the path. And only if you have been a bad parent in some way, even a bad Christian parent, um, that's when you see them not wanting to stay in the church or do the things that we think of as Christian behaviors are, they, you know, they might do totally alternative lifestyles. And I appreciate the fact that I was humbled because I think I held a little bit of that um, mm -hmm. when people would tell me about their child going off this way or that way. And I'd think, hmm, I wonder what you did wrong. And the Bible doesn't support that judgment that we make about other people. And it doesn't support it when we make it about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so many women are strangling on this question. Why did this happen? What did I do wrong? And they agonize and they obsess. Uh, and withdraw from life because they feel it had to have been me. Shame. Uh, we'll do that, right? Yeah. And I so appreciate you sharing your struggle with shame and self-blame over what was happening. And I do think this is human nature. I, I think we as Christian parents, we are so mindful. We try so hard to pour into our kids. We want good things for them. We want to see them walk with the Lord. And of course, we take some responsibility. And and there's got to be a little balance in this, right? I mean, we're responsible for some of the things we did and our influence. And in particular, if we made mistakes, we certainly have responsibility. But ultimately, what God's saying in Ezekiel 18 is that the ultimate responsibility for a child's behavior is on the child. And it's not yeah. on us. And, you know, that is supported when you look at the first father who was mm -hmm. God. Yes. His children, Adam and Eve, uh, when the apple got bitten, uh, he didn't say, what did I do wrong? <laughs> it, he, he placed the responsibility on Adam and Eve, and yeah. they had consequences for that. And even in the story in Luke of the prodigal child, uh, that father, we have no indication that he had done anything but be in a wonderful dad to mm -hmm. his prodigal. Um, but sometimes it happens. And so understanding this whole free will condition that people are born with can relieve 
a bunch of the pain mm -hmm. that people are carrying and that is immobilizing them, just paralyzing them. Uh, Nan and I have often talked, we, we know we own our choices, our behaviors. Um, we are responsible for those and how they have influenced who our kids are. Um, at the same time, we have to remove ourselves from ultimate responsibility of their behavior. And I think this is really important. I don't think anybody should ever say, oh, so it's not on me. Well, then fine. I don't have any responsibility. I can do whatever. No. no. I mean, clearly we want to bring good things to our kids. And if you're mm -hmm. listening or watching right now and you're thinking, and I haven't been, you know, I've been MIA or I've been harsh. I've exasperated my kids to use the language of uh, Ephesians chapter six. Uh, okay, it's time to own that, repent and change. Um, but our kids are responsible for themselves. Yeah. And to your point, we should also not be too harsh, uh, harsh and uh, judgmental about other parents when we hear about what's happening with their kids, uh, lest that become our own situation. Okay, let's move to another one that you like to talk about. And that is uh, looking at the Ten Commandments and uh, turning our kids into idols. Do we sometimes do that? Well, when you think about the definition of an idol, it's anything or anyone who takes God's place in our life. Mm -hmm. And so we are living our life in response to this person or thing. Um, I have joined a few Facebook forums, um, Christian mothers of estranged children, uh, hurting moms with, with adult kids. And there, there are thousands of people on these various Facebook sites because this is such a common problem. Hmm. And when I read the comments from these parents, uh, many of them are not the ones strangling on false guilt. They are, you can tell by the words they use and their attitude, they are totally oblivious to how they're coming across mm. and what mm. kind of an impact that must have on their kids. Hmm. So it, it, there's a balance. <laughs> you can't go too far either direction. Yeah. And, and do we sometimes idolize our kids and their behavior and what they'll become or how good and right and proper they will be? And if they're not that, then it's just so easy to be completely consumed with guilt or anger or harshness that that's, that's eroding the relationship because we've idolized too much of what we want them to be. Well, I had an awakening when I was monitoring my own thoughts one time and, and uh, I realized I'd been thinking, I'm not sure about heaven. If, if I really want to go there, if my kids aren't going to be there Hmm. Hmm. And it thought, okay, I'm more eager to be there with them than I am to see Jesus and be there with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, you know, there are ways that we can kind of see that we have turned them to idols. If our whole joy in life is dependent on how they are treating us or how they are shunning us, uh, then that's a sign that we've put them in a place they don't need to be. Wow. That's, and when you realize that, what was the next step? <laughs> Confess it. Hmm. Um, continue to love my kids like crazy, but to be more aware that rather than all my thoughts going to improve that relationship, to give more ad additional attention beyond what I was already doing, to building my relationship with the one who totally does accept me and uh, who I do want to serve. That's good. Let's go to another one. You make the observation that dishonoring our own parents sometimes complicates the relationship we have with our children. Absolutely. Um, this is something not many people think about, but when I was writing my book, uh, I, beca I became very aware that um, one of the first things we can do, we hopefully we would do this before our own kids would um, be rebelling in any way. But if 
if they have already started that, then look back at your own family and ask yourself, how well did I honor hmm. my father and mother? And because of the times that we lived in, 50s, 60s, uh, for me, <laughs> uh, we weren't overtly dishonoring, but in our hearts, uh, I held some resentments that I carried for a long time. And uh, finally had the wherewithal to write a tribute letter to my mother and present it to her in which I thanked her uh, for the many good things that she had done in my life. And she treasured that. She had it on her wall. Even when she went to the nursing home, she took it with her. She hardly had anything there. But uh, the the feeling that I had finally let go of whatever wrongs I had happened upon. And in my case, it wasn't very big wrong. So it helps me understand that a parent doesn't have to have done a whole lot for a child to hold bitterness against them. Um, and so uh, I don't know if you read in my book uh, some apologies, but I know my husband wrote one did you get a chance to read that one at all? I did, I did not read that one. Okay. Well, let me see if I can find it here for you. Um, this is in a chapter about humbling yourself um, because we do need to humble ourselves with our own parents. Um, and I won't read all of this, but uh, my new husband, we've been married six years now, um, was a pastor in his 40s and it was Mother's Day. And that's a hard day for mothers ordinarily, especially if you have anybody estranged from you. You, you uh, assume everyone else is enjoying a wonderful day except you. <laughs> uh, and so before his congregation that day, in lieu of a sermon, he read a letter he'd written to his mom. And I'll just read a few little bit out of that. Okay. Uh, Dear mom, I'm in my 40s now. You are bedridden and no longer able to recognize me. Only a few people on this planet have ever seen you. Your picture has never been in a newspaper or magazine. Now your world is limited to only dad's constant care and the few others who help him. One day your body will die like your mind has already done. But mom, you will live forever. As I pondered what to talk about this Mother's Day Sunday, I felt compelled to write to you. I know you can't understand, and yet I sense you understood for many years what I now have the spirit to confess to you and to God and before the congregation. I am impressed with my blindness and stupidity and your wisdom and love. <laughs> when I was growing up on our sharecropper's farm, I saw you as fat, uneducated, poor, and old. You are ignorant of most of this world and its concepts. You broke you spoke broken English. You could read a little and write essentially nothing, hardly equipped to raise six children. It didn't matter those conditions were essentially beyond your control. You'd been born into that environment and equipped the way God provided, and you'd risen steps above your 13 brothers and sisters. I thought I was tough because I played football, but toughness is being true to the challenge of continuously performing as a Christian mother in today's world. Toughness is saying no when no needs to be said. Mom, you spent countless hours in prayer to be so strong, so much like Jesus. I know you prayed because I spied you on your knees at the end of every exhausting day of serving your family, often falling asleep with your head resting on the edge of the bed. Now, Mom, I see how beautiful you really were during all those years. I remember no profanity came from your lips. You never cursed at me, dad, or any human, animal or occurrence. You never called a person a fool. And he goes on and on. Hmm. You never verbally degraded you. You always were an example of winning by being a tough, loving Christian mom. You know, not everyone can uh, preach a whole sermon full of our sadness that we didn't... Uh, treat them the way we wish we would have. But in our hearts, uh, some kind of a tribute heals something. 
And interestingly, our children can witness that, where before they might have seen you criticizing grandpa and grandma. Yeah, right. Uh, they might wonder why you seem to have changed your tune, and it might open a chance for you to say, uh, you know, I, I regret that uh, I carried resentment so long in my life. You know, as I look back at raising my children, the one thing I wish would have been the prime thing I taught them, it would be to forgive quickly and completely. If you have that skill, life's going to be pretty good. That's really good. It's very moving, the story that he told. And I can totally see how taking a posture of humility in front of your kids as it relates to your own parents you know, softly invite your children to maybe do the same with you. Uh, you know, who knows how that might uh, spin off into some influence in their mm -hmm. lives. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I'm mindful of some other things that you talk about, um, getting rid of bitterness and just managing your tongue, controlling that. We read in Ephesians 4, talks about that a lot. And then in Galatians chapter 5, there's that great passage about taking off certain parts of us that are unbecoming and putting on things like, you know, the fruit of the spirit that uh, always have a, a much better outcome to life. Uh, do you have any insights into how people can just begin to implement some of those uh, powerful scriptural passages yeah. in terms of those relationships with their yeah, kids? As, as far as the bitterness is concerned, uh, it's, it's very plain. Um, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. So the antidote to bitterness is forgiveness. Hmm. The two main um, verbs that I like to zero in on as a mother of adult children are love and forgiveness. If we can get those two things right. Uh, and the fruit of the spirit is uh, essential to be able to do that. In other words, we as humans are, are so fallible. And you mentioned the sinful nature and what it produces uh, on that list is idolatry, mm -hmm. hostility, quarreling, outburst of anger, dissension, and division. And we say, oh, that's how my kid's acting. But there's a plenty of parents exhibiting those qualities as well. Um, so, but the Holy Spirit, his empowering produces this kind of fruit, and you know them, love, joy, peace, mm -hmm. patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And it says there's no law against these things. Uh, that tells me there's no defense in our kids when that's what they see in us. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing they can complain about, nothing they can be critical of, but we can't do it on our own strength. And so the how-to is to learn to walk in step with the Holy Spirit and let him be in control of our lives. And of course, sometimes I hear people say, well, I would do that if my child would just, you know, back up, be nice, you know, whatever it is that you want them to, to do differently. But that brings us back to the golden rule, doesn't it? <laughs> we got to go first. That's a good way to put it. You know, the, the golden rule is applicable in so many areas of our life, but certainly in rearing adult children. If you want them to uh, be kind to you, love you, be thoughtful, uh, appreciate and be grateful for generosity um, then we need to do the same. And the more we prime the pump with those types of behaviors that we wish were coming our way, the more likely they are mm -hmm. to flow. Uh, and instead, the natural tendency and what is pushed in our society is 
give them a dose of their own medicine. <laughs> right. Uh, or as I used to say when I was a kid, do it to others before they do it to you. <laughs> even worse. Yes. Even, even worse. But of course, uh, the golden rule, Luke 6, uh, 21, do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. You know, you go first and let mm -hmm. that be something that sets the tone. Yes. Well, listen, I have appreciated our conversation. I, I want to end our dialogue with a quote that you included in your book, Life's right. Third Try. And then I'd love for you to comment on it. Okay. In that book, you share that Mother Teresa once said, you will teach them to fly, but they will not fly your flight. You will teach them to dream, but they will not dream your dream. You will teach them to live, but they will not live your life. Nevertheless, she said, in every flight, in every life, in every dream, the print of the way you taught them will remain. Yes, and uh, I, I'm touched even when you read it again because uh, she is right. And we need to have a long view of parenting adult children. Uh, you've talked about not using wrong methods of blending a family and pressure cooker and things, trying to do things quickly, uh, restoring relationships with adult children and making them better, giving them a chance to know the new you that is hopefully maturing over the years. Uh, that That's what we want to do. And to know that children deep down do love their moms, mm -hmm. um, have that confidence and that they are hearing your voice in their minds a lot. Sometimes they're fighting against it, but all that you've put into them is still there just waiting for the day that um, more of it will be expressed. Well, Charlotte, listen, I appreciate your time today. Thanks for being with me. To you, the listener, I just want to say, check the show notes to learn more about Charlotte and her work and ministry and her resources. Or if you have a question you want to leave us or a suggestion for a future episode, let us know. Let me just remind all of you that our year-end matching gift challenge is right now. Family Life Blended is a donor-supported ministry, and we've got every dollar this month is going to match up to $40,000 uh, a gift that has been offered to us. So anything you can do would really be appreciated right now. Yes, we're tax deductible nonprofit. So feel free to make that year in gift. Again, check the show notes for directions about how to do that. Well, next time we're going to be talking with Jim and Shirley Mozina about preparing for and navigating a later life blended family marriage. That's next time on Family Life Blended. I'm Ron Deal. Thanks for listening. And thank you to our production team and donors who make this podcast possible. Family Life Blended is part of the Family Life Podcast Network, helping you pursue the relationships that matter most.